Well, hello out there, you delightful daffodils. Thanks for joining us for a, another week of A Little Greener, a podcast all about nature, conservation, and sustainability. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Sarah, and I am joined by my fellow host, the delightful Casey. Hey, Casey. Hello. Hi. Right as I was like, oh, wait, I don't have to think of an animal, but the first animal that popped in my head was like baby beluga. <laughs> oh, that's so good. I should have done that. I was, it was too, you, you went right in for it. I was proud of you, so... Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome <laughs> Yay! <to> another- <laughs> Yay, we're back. Sarah, how are you doing? I'm all right. I don't think I have anything environmental to report other than to say, as as you and I were just discussing, Casey, I went up north over this past week. So sorry, everybody. We, we didn't get you a new episode last week, but it was the most perfect Midwest spring weather that you could possibly ask for. I love living in the South. I know that I love living in the South. I know that it's cold and gross half the year when I'm up North and I don't like it. But man, if every day was like the days that I was up there, it was just beautiful, blue skies, perfect temperature, tree, like leaves budding on the trees, just beautiful, beautiful. So it made me a little bit homesick, but it was really fun to be up there. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, I mean, the Midwest could have definitely just decided it was going to be a not so pretty spring. It absolutely day could day have too, had six so inches of good. snow on the ground, yeah. also. <laughs> <laughs> but it did. Extremely windy and rainy. Yes. <laughs> yeah, this weekend it was like almost 80 degrees where I was at. So really, it's just like July punching <laughs> us in the face right now, <laughs> along with a bunch of pollen. So I don't know what's going on, but everybody's really excited about gardening. So, <laughs> so it's it's good for business, but uh, but it, and it's nice to be able to go outside too. That's the other yeah. Part. Like, that was I took a walk with my mom and my sister when I was up there, and we just did a quick ten minute walk. But we by sound had about five or six different types of birds just on that ten minute walk. So we oh, we got nice. our nature time in. That's great. Uh, I want to thank. Folks for reaching out to us and uh, commenting on last episode. I got a couple of people reaching out saying, hey, thanks for that. That was a really, it's more complicated than I thought. Um, And I learned a lot. So I learned a lot too, guys. So this is what we aim for. I love hearing that. And Casey and I probably chatted for another 30 minutes (laughs) after we stopped (laughs) recording to try to figure out where our heads were in relation. This was for our episode on Tokite, the the orca who they're talking about sending back to the waters where she came from. So there, yeah, there's just, there's a lot to think about. There's so much more sort of tangential topics and things that we, we want to discuss in the future on that too. So yeah, we appreciate you listening and, and allowing for the, the nuance in that discussion. Yeah. Well, this week we're shifting gears a little bit. We're going towards the sustainability mode on a topic requested by our friend Rebecca. Um, She asked that we talk a little bit about babies, which is also very topical for me. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, my question for you this week, Sarah, is I'm having a baby in June. It is the first baby in my family in a long time like it's the first of the next generation i'm the oldest of my cousins on both sides of the family so it's been a while (laughs) since there's been a baby around this is the first one coming around um and even on andrew's side of the family our their nephews are in minnesota so we don't interact with them super super often so i don't have much baby experience i consider myself slightly awkward around babies (laughs) i think i'm gonna get good at it but like if if you're a like you know, within my friend group and I interacted with your baby and you're like, yeah, it's a little, I'm not your most like put together self. I don't know what I'm doing. So <laughs> we'll find out. And Sarah, I was wondering how much interaction have you had with babies? I think you're going to get up to speed pretty quickly. <laughs> I would consider myself a novice when it comes to babies, but not a complete beginner. I have no children. So you all can take everything that I say on this episode with a huge grain of salt and recognize that it is very much an outsider's opinion. But I do have a lot of friends with kids. I babysat when I was younger, so I probably actually was more comfortable with babies years ago than I am now. Most of my friends with kids 
their their kids have already grown up. I have a nephew as well, but I was not living close by to a lot of my friends when their babies were babies. So I haven't done a whole, like if you handed me, I, I love babies. So I'm happy to hold your baby. I'm happy to feed your baby, but you have to like hand me the bottle. I don't know how to make a bottle. I can change a diaper, <laughs> yeah. but you got to sort of remind me everything that I'll I'll need to do, but I I can do it. So that's sort of the level that I'm at. I enjoy babies. I have been around babies. I'm I'm a little rusty and I, I don't have a super in-depth level of knowledge. Well you've already mentioned two of our topics for today. Today we're gonna talk about some of the environmental impacts associated with having a baby and different options you have out there and their comparative environmental footprints. So stick around, we'll be right back and we're gonna talk about uh, sustainability and baby. We're back. The first thing that really pops up when you start Googling like sustainability and babies is should you even have children to begin with? So I wanted to start with that, Sarah. Um, Have you heard that before? How do you feel about it? I've heard it and I cannot stand it. it. It's never been... And I don't mean to say that if that's something that you are considering as an individual for yourself, fine. It's not. It's never been really a a factor for me and I just I just don't like the idea of telling anybody that they shouldn't have kids yeah you know I think that we talk about the environment we talk about sustainability meaning we want to keep things going for the future right that's what sustainability is really all about so we can't do that if we don't (laughs) don't have future generations And I think that some of the arguments that are made about having too many people are not backed up appropriately. There there are issues with the way that we do things more so than the number of people that we have, if that makes sense. A hundred percent. I've thought about it a lot. Yeah. Like you said, you don't want to have kids because like the environment's important to you and you think that that is a way that you can reduce your personal carbon footprint, then that's your choice. Good for you. Happy for you. I don't think people should have kids by default. I think they should have kids through a lot of thought and personal consideration and preparation. And maybe if you're an environmentally conscious person, you're going in with a little bit of that lens, lens as well. I take a lot of issue with people shaming folks for having yes. kids. That's a good word to use. Yeah, we. I wouldn't shame anybody right. over this decision. Yeah. As we've talked about before, your personal carbon footprint is super small compared to corporations, governments, etc. So like the idea that you having a child is somehow something that you need to take personal like shame over compared to some of the overall systems in the world that that's just not cool. (laughs) Um, The overpopulation theory has been really popular, especially since the 80s, but it often is used to apply to people who live in countries with less resources um, for having, quote, too many children a lot of times. So there's a lot of like issues with framing some of these things around money and um, country of origin and things like that. I think that gets to be more sticky than people understand sometimes when they're they're talking about that. But I one of the quotes that has stuck with me since it was said is actually a quote from Hank Green, who we've talked about before. Love. We love Hank Green. Um, and I follow him on Facebook. And in 2021, he said, pro tip, Talking about having or not having children inside of a lens of carbon footprint is a great way to alienate a huge number of people. They're children. They're a lot of people's number one reason for caring about the climate at all. Mm. And that has really just stuck with me because it resonates a lot with me uh, because we're talking about the future that lots of us aren't going to see. So who's going to see it? Kids. Yeah. Um, So I think we need to raise a generation of environmentally conscious, responsible, resilient children and considering you know the the world that they're going to be living in is part of that and i think that just this this has been alluded to within everything that we've been saying but having children 
is a big deal and people have a very strong desire to have kids not everybody obviously but a lot of people do and so to tell somebody who has a strong desire to be a parent that no you shouldn't have children because it's environmentally irresponsible is just it's just it doesn't make sense no and I don't think that you're gonna win a lot of friends that way And again, you can make that personal choice. There's, uh, I've linked an article in the show notes where they interview some young people who have decided that they uh, don't want to have kids because they see the potential impacts of climate change making a world that's very hard to live in. And that's, again, a, a personal choice you get to make. But um, but I'm having a baby, so... Yay! Yay, we're having a baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you, so you've decided to have kids. Someone you know or Check. love has decided <laughs> to have kids. Check. There are definitely ways you can work on your environmental impact when it it comes to having children. I want to start this episode by saying I am pregnant and I have already received lots of unsolicited opinions about how I should spend my time while pregnant and what we should do when the baby is born. And they're all well-meaning things, um, but I think a lot of them ignore things like... Um, the fact that I have to earn an income to keep my house (laughs) and, um, and, and so much depends on your time, your support system, your income, your location, your cultural background, all of these things impact the choices you make as a parent. So the most important thing is that your kid's taken care of. The things we're going to talk about today is not also a shaming mechanism. It is about understanding our options a little bit better. But take care of your kid. I don't know. Whatever it takes to take care of your kid. Like everything else that we've talked about, this is about having the discussion, maybe bringing up some things that people may not have thought about before, bringing some more information to the table, and then you do with it what you can and desire. Yep. And as Sarah said, neither of us are parents. I'm going to be a parent. but That means that, I don't know, I could be you know, talking about something that three months from now, (laughs) I have a completely different opinion about the feasibility of, but we'll see. Uh, But we love your guys' input, especially if you're someone who is, you know, actively involved in raising a child, whether it's yours or somebody else's. Uh, So I've broken it down into three sections. We're going to talk about preparation for the baby coming. We're going to talk about feeding your baby, and we're going to talk about diapering your baby. Those are the big three that I can think of. Yep, big things. So prepping for baby, this is going to be a pretty short, easy section. Babies grow very quickly and they grow out of things very quickly. And you need so much stuff for them, Sarah. (laughs) (laughs) So much. There's so many items that you need to purchase in that would not just be in your house Mm -hmm. anyway. Things from like car seats that are really important for their safety to just like clothes and rockers and decorations and who I don't know so much stuff so that one of the easiest ways you can cut that down is to go for hand-me-downs and that I've been really blessed to have people in my network who have recently had children who have been able to provide me with a lot of stuff that I would have otherwise had to buy new and I think yeah that's a, a big thing that I've seen with my parent friends is that network and reaching out and not just for hand-me-downs, but also to help you figure out which of those things you do need. Because as you said, you do need so many things. You need things that I'm sure I would not think of in my wildest dreams that you might need to have for a baby. But there's also a lot of stuff out there that gets pushed on parents that may or may not actually be helpful to you with this. So I love seeing my friends that are expecting ask for like, hey, what are the top three things that you are glad that you have? What are some things that everybody says that you need that you've never used, you know, to try to help narrow down that sort of list of stuff and to hopefully get things that are going to be good quality and actually helpful so using your network both as a resource to to get used things but also to figure out what things maybe you actually can just bypass just not get at all yeah i will say the internet is an extremely unhelpful place when it comes to this in my opinion overwhelming overwhelming so many opinions i remember i early on was on pinterest just being i don't know how to build a baby registry i don't (laughs) 
I don't know. I ha- this is like my bridal shower. I hadn't been to a bridal shower prior to my own. I've never been to a baby shower prior to my own than to my own like in a, a full scale situation yeah. we've you know honored ki- people who are having babies but like not in like a party situation so I was like I don't know what to put on this registry but it is overwhelming and even like going on Pinterest they're like top 10 things I didn't need on my registry and I was like excellent and the first one was like a crib and I was like I <laughs> I'm sure there's a way that that works but that's not how I'm going right <laughs> so so yeah especially if, if you've got friends if you've got family members that you kind of know what their perspective is, it can really help you, like you said, narrow down what you need. And for, uh, I want to to give a special shout out to my friends, Krissa and Alex, who have a very, very cute two-year-old who are very happily getting rid of a lot of stuff out of their house (laughs) Um, and definitely helping us out. So that's great. So really good things that you can get as hand-me-downs, whether it's from a friend or maybe at a secondhand shop, clothes, baby gets to grow out of clothes immediately. So Mm -hmm. one of my coworkers, her daughter had a baby, she's bringing me garbage bags full of clothes. So appreciate that nursery decorations you know a lot of those are only going to be cute for so long I think my room hasn't changed since I was like five when in my childhood home <laughs> but a lot of you know kids grow up and and will get out of those decorations uh rockers a lot of toys uh, but there are certain things that you should think twice about before getting as hand-me-downs and the first is a car seat so mm. if you don't know the history of that car seat, if it's been in a crash, like it still needs to pass certain safety regulations. And if it's a certain age, they may have updated the standards since then. That same goes for cribs. If cribs were made before a certain year, I think it's like 2011, and they have the drop sides, a lot of those got recalled because of safety issues. So you can get a hand-me-down crib, but it has to have all its parts, and it should be past a certain year to make sure that it meets current safety things. Same with high chairs things like that so you can get them just make sure that they're in good condition and they meet safety standards for now things that i had seen that said don't don't use hand-me-down pacifiers or bottle nipples luckily those are two like fairly low cost items that you should be able to replace um and don't do hand-me-down breast pumps because those are harder to clean and you want to make sure that you got clean materials (laughs) i feel like those things make sense (laughs) those are good yes (laughs) So that's my my first kind of section there. It's There's so much stuff. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff we could dive into. You can go for more natural materials. Uh, one of the things I'm doing right now is I am sewing bibs. Yay! Oh, <laughs> I so had cute. some extra flannel material. So I didn't go out and buy this extra. I just had it laying around. So I'm, yeah. I'm making bibs for me and a couple friends who are about to have kids. Think about what you can repurpose. I mean, even I would maybe when it comes to decorating, obviously, I think people really enjoy doing yeah. the nursery so once again do do the thing but you could also think about hey you know what is maybe I can pick a paint color or some decor that is going to be adjustable and age well you know not yes. don't just get a whole bunch of things that you're going to have to get rid of you know but as soon as the baby becomes a toddler or whatever you know but I think all of those things that we talk about or think about in our own daily lives in terms of consumerism and and shopping just be mindful for the ways that you can reduce repurpose yeah perfect it's uh that's a good way to end that one feeding your baby things i hadn't really thought about so much about an environmental footprint but i I wanted to talk about it formula versus breast milk i've never once thought about this in terms of an environmental lens so i'm interested so for this episode there are a lot of articles out there from like mommy blogs and from Mm. uh, just the general news or a lot of companies that are trying to sell you something. (laughs) Uh, So I tried to get a lot of scientific sources for this and they're linked in the show notes. So according to the CDC, only 45% of babies are exclusively breastfed for the first three months of life. That drops down to less than 25% when you look at the first six months of life. Again, however you can get your baby fed is the most important thing. Um, But the CDC does recommend breastfeeding exclusively up to six months. Um, There's a lot of health benefits related to that. I know personally in my life, like that's something I'm aiming for, but it's also something that I know a lot of friends have either struggled with just like the actual process or just the overwhelming nature of it. Yeah. So what's the environmental impact of it? 
I found a study in the Netherlands <laughs> that seemed to be the most comprehensive of them. There actually aren't a lot of studies when it comes to it, but they found that four months of exclusive breastfeeding had a 35 to 72 percent lower environmental impact than exclusive formula feeding. It's kind of like a, a big range. That's a huge range. Yeah. <laughs> um, this particular study, they were looking at, so environmental impact is a very broad term to use, mm -hmm. right? Originally, when I was going to type that, I was like carbon footprint, because that's a lot of times how that's framed. But they actually looked at global warming potential as part of it, freshwater and marine eutrophication, land acidification, and land use. So there are some multiple factors in there. I guess there's a like standardized weighted process of a life cycle assessment that they're using for this study. And so that's those are sort of the the areas they focused on. You look like you have something to Is say. This maybe a really <laughs> stupid question, but when they look at this, I assume they're looking at like how formula is made. Right. Yeah. And where that comes from. Are they looking at what the mom eats to provide nutrition for the like is that what it's that's exactly comparing? what it is okay. yeah all right so it it seems like it's fairly theoretical they looked at powdered formula specifically again this is in the netherlands so i don't know how like cross applicable this is across different countries mm -hmm. but with formula uh much of formula is made from cow's milk cow's milk is more fatty than human milk so they like skim it they mix it with vegetable oils and nutrients so the researchers put together the impact of the formula like actual making what the ingredients are in it the packaging the processing the transport and the storage as well as the like average amount of formula that's wasted because there's food waste involved sure. with it um, so the vast majority of the impact came from the use of the cow's milk which as we've talked about in your dairy episode non-negligible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a pretty good environmental impact from dairy farming. Some of the land use change was also from the vegetable oils. I tried to see if they were specific in it about what kind of vegetable oil they were using, but I didn't see that in there. So I don't know if that's like a soybean or a palm oil that typically comes from the tropics or if it's something that's a little more generalized. With breastfeeding, they used a major study that looked at the diets of Norwegians and isolated the habits of women of reproductive ages and then looked at the increased calories that it would take to sustain lactation and then calculated that range based off of that. So you're right. Yes. Fascinating. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> I really, really cool. enjoy that. So again, they're looking at calories. So they were saying like, if you got all of your calories from plant-based sources, your carbon footprint associated with breastfeeding would be much, much lower than if you got it from a high meat-based diet. Is that why, or at least part of the reason why there's such a broad range there? I think it is part of it. I think part of it is that there are different formula brands and like where things come from. They said that their study coincided with another study that said that formula use had about double the impact of uh, breastfeeding exclusively. So they had another study cited in there that they felt like they aligned with. They said that they disagreed with, they not that they disagreed, they came to a different conclusion than a different study because the study that I'm talking about assumed that the children were getting the breast milk specifically from the mother's breast mm. rather than pumping, putting it into a bottle chilling it, warming it back up, feeding the baby. So with that, that other study suggested that breastfeeding might have an equal or greater impact than formula because of the electronic use of the pump and the, the freezer storage and things like that. So there are different elements to it that do yeah. change that number around. I feel like anytime you do any sort of a life cycle assessment, that, I mean, there's going to be some of those factors. I just thoroughly enjoy that this exists. I think <laughs> it's really interesting. I think it's it's sort of fun to sort of, if you will, to look at. I, like you said, dairy does have an impact on our carbon footprint for sure. It's not like the biggest thing in the world. So, you know, this wouldn't be a big factor in my own personal decision on how to feed the baby, but I think it's interesting to know. Yeah. And that's actually something I wanted to bring up is that the CDC has a page on breastfeeding and they talk about 
reasons why people don't breastfeed, even though it is the CDC, the American Board of Pediatrics, others recommendation to do it. None of it has to do with the like none of their like pros about it have to do with the environment as much (laughs) because it's so low on the list of what is the physical reality of feeding your baby through that. They say issues of having issues with latching the baby or lactation or nutrition and societal things like unsupportive workplace policies, lack of parental leave. Like that's certainly something that I think about when I think about how long if I'm able to successfully breastfeed, how long I will be able to do it because you got to be around your baby. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. so that means a lot of times not being at work. So there are some differences in breastfeeding practices across different cultures, across different races here in the U.S. um, and ethnicities. So there's a lot of different factors that go into this. Environmental concerns, probably not very high on your list, but now you know. (laughs) Now you know the things that influence it. Another thing that actually Rebecca brought up when she was pitching this idea was the glass versus plastic bottles. I didn't actually look at the carbon footprint of these things. I was more interested in the microplastics element of them. So recent studies have found the presence of micro and nanoplastics in the placenta, the meconium, which is the baby poop, baby poop basically. Yeah. It's like the first baby poop. Yeah. And then actual baby poop of newborn babies. <laughs> um, we consume microplastics all the time. We inhale them. Babies are often exposed to it when they're drinking from plastic bottles. So I found a study that was summarized on NPR. They looked at plastic baby bottles and their likelihood to shed microplastics. They looked at about 10 different bottles, which represented 70% of the market. And That was one of the reasons they wanted to isolate that is because they said for plastic bottles, there's actually very few options out there for differences. And so you are able to get a good idea of the generalized scope of microplastics in there. They used the World Health Organization standard for making formula. So I don't know. I've never made formula. If in the U.S. people do this as a practice standard, But you're supposed to heat the water to at least 158 degrees Fahrenheit to reduce the bacteria you might encounter in the water. I don't know in areas in the U.S. if you have what you consider safe drinking water, if that's a standardized practice or if that's just what they recommend for people across the world who might not have proper sanitation in their water. They found that the combination of that heat, though, and then when you shake the bottle to mix the formula, releases just millions of microplastics into there. They said it's actually like the flaking of the interior of the plastic bottle. Um, Even if filled with room temperature water, they still found that they shed tens to hundreds of thousands of microplastics and they continue to shed them for 21 days. So the researchers said, don't panic. If you're like listening to this and you're like, oh no, I got to throw out all my plastic bottles. They said, We probably poop out most of the microplastics that we ingest. That includes babies, too. We don't have evidence that these microplastics specifically harm kids in, Mm -hmm. like, a certain way. However, they they note that research is definitely needed. Like, I don't want my kid to eat a lot of microplastics. So more research is needed, but we're not super scared of it. Right. But it's something to be noted. It's, again, it's probably, it's been happening. You know, babies drink out of plastic bottles all the time when they grow up to yep. be fine. I'm pretty sure they've banned several things that were yeah. in bottles when we were kids for so, the next generation. Yeah. So, I yeah, I think that the, the way that you said it is great. Like, once again, here it is. Now you know, maybe ignorance is bliss sometimes <laughs> with some of these. But now you know, and you can choose... To, to do with that what you will and you know maybe we'll, we'll know more in the future and we'll change it up when we know more that's what we do we keep learning we keep improving as we go along yeah you have options um so they they noted that children in china drink mostly out of glass water or glass bottles so they are less likely to ingest microplastics yeah. from that um versus kids in the u.s and the uk very, very likely to be consuming like 2 million microplastics a day based on our our plastic bottles. Um, So I have bought some glass bottles that I'm hoping to use instead. 
I think that glass bottles would be fun again, non parent. <laughs> yes, right. right here. And obviously, there are the other the risks that might come along with breaking them and, and all mm-hmm. of that. But there's something that feels maybe old fashioned about them to me that I enjoy. I enjoy the aesthetic <laughs> of a glass bottle. I agree. I feel like it reminds me of when I was a kid and I would play with that like one. I don't know if you had this. It was like a baby bottle of milk and then you oh, turn that, it upside down yep. and then the, all the milk disappeared. Sure did. Oh, yep. So cool. And it, it looked like a g- old glass bottle. It was yeah. plastic, but it looked like an old glass bottle. Um, If you are using plastic bottles, make sure you're not microwaving them. That's not recommended anyway because you can. it basically unevenly heats the plastic and so it can be harmful for your baby. It can have hot pockets of hot formula in there. Um, But also those hot pockets can cause extra microplastics to shed off. So they said, try and not do that. Use room temperature water. If you're like mixing hot stuff, you can do that in a separate bowl and then pour it once it's lukewarm into the plastic water bottle. And that will help some of, of your reducing microplastics that way. So that brings us to the one that took the most time to figure that out. <laughs> um, so Sarah, I'm going to show you. Cute. So is I've this got... handmade by you? It is not handmade no? okay. by me. I'll explain some of my background. So I have a reusable diaper in my hand, half of a reusable diaper, actually, which I didn't even know when I asked for it. <laughs> Diapering your baby cloth versus disposable. I feel like this is the big one that probably comes to mind when people think of the environment and their babies. Yes. And for good reason, like you go through so many diapers, so many diapers. You're supposed to change your kid when they're newborn every one and a half to two hours. That's 12 diapers a day for a while. (laughs) So, So you're going through thousands of diapers over the course of this kid getting potty trained. And the thought of that many disposable diapers to me is so (laughs) anxiety-inducing. Again, I'm not a parent yet, and so it might just become normal, but it freaks me out. With all the other things where we're like, we'll bake our own bread, so that way we don't have plastic bags. And (laughs) and having diapers, oh gosh, it just runs counter to my interior life. Um, So what I found is I wanted to know, first of all, when did disposable diapers become a thing? Apparently they became a thing in the 1930s, um, but the U.S. was a little slow to adopt the actual convenience of the disposable diaper. I'm sure they weren't as good as they are now. I'm sure that's part of it. But in the 1960s and 70s, that's really when they took off. Now over 95% of babies in the U.S. use disposable diapers, with disposables also becoming increasingly popular in countries that have higher birth rates and now more access to rising incomes as well. So lots of people using disposable diapers. They've as I said, improved dramatically since the original ones. But originally, people were cloth diapering. Mm -hmm. This isn't like a new hippie thing. This is like my grandmother was cloth diapering. Yeah. No, I remember like the old school, just like plain white cloth diapers that you pin. Yeah. Yeah. And you can still get those today. Mm -hmm. Um, I was talking to a couple people who you know, are around my mom's age who, uh, my aunt said that she lasted one week cloth diapering when, (laughs) when her first baby was born, that was about 29 years ago. So it was during a slightly different time. I also talked to two women who used a cloth diapering laundry service. So one where instead of washing your own diapers, you use them and then you put them in like a pail with some conditioner and then you leave that out and it gets picked up and you get new ones in interesting which would have its own footprint as well right and we'll talk a little bit about that uh but my mom said she did not cough diaper me because she watched her mother take i'm sorry guys this is gross but this we're talking about poop (laughs) Um, take the cloth diaper for her brothers and dunk it in the toilet to like flush out the poop rinse it out and then like throw it like so there is a lot more intimate connection there with those cloths you have to be able to shape it correctly to your particular baby and you're going to interact with that poop a lot more and so I think that that probably for our parents generation was the thought in 
that sort of, okay, disposable sound really nice. <laughs> so Sarah, what are some issues that you think moms are considering when they are cloth versus disposable diapering? Their time, their money that they might have to spend on diapering is probably an issue. The cleaning aspect of it. I mean, I just having pets, right? I tried a couple years ago, I was going to get rid of my paper towels and I was going to only have like rags and, you know, washable napkins and all that kind of stuff and that didn't even last for me with a dog because I I couldn't do the laundry often enough to keep up with all of the cleaning that I was having to do so I think you know parents all have different situations and different numbers of kids and different amounts of time to spend on this so I think you know they have to weigh like how much laundry am I gonna have to do how much money am I gonna have to spend on diapers those types of things yeah, that's a good point. I also, we have a lot of cloth napkins uh, in my house. I don't use them on like cat vomit and things mm-hmm. like that. Like I'm I'm using my paper towels on that. I will clean the counter with my cloth, the cloth napkins, right. but I'm not going to pick up, yeah, uh, the pet stuff with it. I took a cloth diapering webinar because oh. I decided I wanted to try cloth diapering. And then again, when I initially Googled it, I found out that there are like 10 different systems for cloth diapering. It's not simple as just being like, I would like to do it. It's come a long way from the plain white cloths with pins for sure. Yes. Which are still around. Yes. But I got a targeted ad on Instagram um, from a company called Assembly. And it turns out that is actually the same brand that I had asked for on my registry, the reusable diapers. I, very silly on my part, didn't do enough research on that particular brand and ordered half of a diaper. So what I have in my hand right now is the outer layer of a cloth diaper in this. So you can get cloth diapers that have disposable liners. You can get cloth diapers that are one giant piece that you wash. And then the system that I am going to be trying has an interior preformed cloth diaper made of cotton and then the exterior which is actually made of uh recycled water bottles so this is not an ad this is my real life experience um (laughs) and so they made a lot of claims during this webinar about the environmental impact and the benefits of cloth diapering of course they did like these women cloth diapered their babies and also they're trying to sell you cloth diapers as well so i'm not going off of what they told me there but that was a really good starting point for doing research about some of the claims that they made So some of the issues that have come up in my research, the first is actually health of the baby. So this is something that older folks have come up with uh, when I've talked about it. You can tell that I'm not a parent just because that (laughs) wasn't the first thing that I listed in my well health of the baby thinking about is really related to diaper rash. Now diaper Mm -hmm. rash is super common. One of the like nurses reports I was reading said that 50% of babies get diaper rash. It was brought up very early in the webinar I was saying. Uh, I was watching basically our disposable diapers are super, super absorbent. They're really good at their job and it wicks the moisture away from the baby's butt. And so that's good at preventing diaper rash. Diaper rash is when the moisture, but also the ammonia buildup from the urine ends up impacting the outer layer of the skin or contact with feces. The lady from the webinar and I can I can see where she's coming from on this one said basically you're recommended to change your kid every hour and a half when they're a newborn if you're changing them hour and a half to two hours when they're a newborn you're are like you're pulling things away faster than what you should be getting diaper rash people leave their kids in disposables longer and allow them to have multiple urinations in between because it absorbs so much they don't have to change as often but that you are recommended to change often so her thing was if you're changing often enough it shouldn't be an issue obviously like that's sounds like a very nice thing in theory but that's a lot of diaper changes that i'm sure people get tired of (laughs) so it results in less diaper rash disposables also may help them sleep through the night better the cons are is that just so the reusables that I'm talking about are made out of cotton. They are absorbent, but not as absorbent. And disposables are made out of plastics with some carcinogens in it as well. 
So they've got wood pulp in it, which I didn't. Do you know diapers have wood pulp in them? No. Yeah, apparently. Some of the disposable brands I was looking at, they were like, oh, yeah, our wood pulp is recycled. So that's how we're getting our carbon footprint down. I can't say I've I've ever thought too much about what actually. What's happening in there. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, they've developed a lot of polymers that help uh, absorb that moisture, trap it back there. But a lot of these diapers also have fragrances and things that can cause irritation for some babies. So some babies are not going to react well to disposable diapers because you have some of those synthetics that are in close contact with the skin. So that is like a health of the baby area for it. Um, but performance of the diaper has to be up there as well. Right. Without cotton being as absorbent as synthetics, you are going to have to change more often. You have to change your baby to make sure they're still comfortable. You want to make sure they don't have blowouts, which is <laughs> scary. This diaper company claimed that they're blowout free. So I now want to mm. test this as a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, can't wait yeah. to hear the reports back on that Check one. in with me in six months. Yes. <laughs> so it's going to depend a lot also on the type of like when you're like disposable versus cloth. It's really like, all these different brands of disposable versus all these different methods mm-hmm. of cloth. There's not a very good one-to-one comparison on a lot of these. Um, convenience, you can throw a disposable diaper out. There's not, you don't have to worry right. about storing it or laundering it. And in my mind, I guess beyond, behind health, uh, if I were actually a parent, I, I just feel like this has got to be the biggest one for parents. Yeah. You've got so much going on. Especially if it's your first, well, I shouldn't even say that because if it's not your first baby, maybe you got three other little kids running around that you're trying to deal with. So I I understand this being a big factor for a lot of people. Yeah, I do want to say that your vision and my vision of cloth diapering of that that like square rag with the little clothespin on it. They have developed so much now. So they are a lot easier to use than what our grandparents were using. Yeah, so I think if you've been as a, a maybe parent to be, if you've been scared away from the reusable because of this convenience factor, definitely like look into it again because it might not be what you're imagining it to be. I with one of my first friends or my earliest friends to have kids, if you will, she did reusable and sort of introduced me to this world of, you know, all these cute little covers and the, you know, yes. removable inserts and all, all of that. And it was, yeah, that it opened my eyes for sure. Yeah. So originally when I was researching it, I was going to invest and I still might eventually invest in basically there's a sprayer that you can attach to your toilet. That's almost like a cross between a bidet and then the sprayer you use to wash your dishes on the side of the mm-hmm. sink. If you're fancy like that and you have one Uh, and you can use those instead of being my grandma and dunking your hand in the water, you can spray the the stuff into the the toilet. According to the lady from the webinar, newborns who are exclusively on a liquid diet, um, especially if they're breastfed because there's less of the oils in it, you don't really have to worry as much about that because their poop is like very paste and very water soluble. So you can just kind of wipe and then put it right in your washing machine, then as they get older and on solid foods, that might be something that, that I would look into is is doing that part of it. Um, but there's also ones with disposable liners where that's catching most of the waste and you throw that part out and then the, the diaper's really there to catch the extra liquid. Mm-hmm. Money. I think that's like a really big one. I've heard people who are not immediately thinking about the environment, thinking about if I'm buying less diapers. Right. This would be good. I've seen so many different numbers about how much people spend on diapers, anywhere from like $900 to $1,500 in the first year of having a baby on disposable diapers. There's so much money. (laughs) Uh, It's a difficult one to pin down, though, because, again, different brands of and different systems of cloth versus different brands and usage of disposables um, and inflation and all that kind of stuff. That is the nice thing um, about cloth diapers is you're not going to have to worry as much about market fluctuations because you have most of the materials there already. Um, So in general, it seems like if you cloth diaper and you get a laundry service, because that is still a thing. um, So you decide, okay, I'm going to put them in the bin. Someone's going to pick them up and do the laundry process for me and then bring me new ones. That seems to be 
probably about the same cost as regular diapers. Okay. If you launder them yourself, that seems to be the most cost-effective option. The cost would be the initial investment in the cloth diapering system, and then the amount of electricity and water it takes to run your washing machine more frequently, as well as different types of detergent and diaper cream that you're going to have to get. Because I found out from this webinar is that you shouldn't really use petroleum-based baby like diaper rash cream because it interacts with the cotton and it makes oh. it more wicking which you don't want you want it to absorb it you don't yeah. want it to stick against Repel, the baby yeah. skin yeah um and so it can ruin your cloth diapers and then you want certain detergents that are like extra gentle um so there is a little bit of extra inconvenience slash money factor you have to think about in there too however the system once you invest in it it can get you through the whole whole time like there's there's basically only two sizes of these diapers because they've got snaps that will get them from newborn this one goes up to 17 pounds and then there's a size two and that's like it if you are planning on having multiple children cloth diapers absolutely can save you money because you can use them from one kid to the next and you can buy cloth diapers used which sounds gross, but remember, you're, we're putting through the wash. That's the whole point. Um, but you can get them at a discounted rate uh, if you can buy them online. I know that this company actually has like a certified market place for people to resell their old ones of these once their kids are out of diapers. So it's interesting. There was also a claim in there that uh, kids who are cloth diapered potty train faster than kids who are not. Cloth diapering is very popular in China, for example, versus the U.S., and they have kids who potty train faster. One of the studies I looked at said that this is probably more due to cultural differences than the actual diaper themselves. But the yeah. theory that the, the lady had was that the kid does feel more wetness in the cloth diaper, and so they're more immediately responsive to understanding wetting themselves versus, like, I pee and it goes away. Right. <laughs> So it does make logical sense, but doesn't seem to necessarily have the scientific backup that you're looking for. Yeah. And there is, as a sort of tangent to that, if you are looking at, I know we're going to talk more about the environmental impact here, but if you are looking to reduce the amount of diapers that you're going to need, there is this whole uh, infant potty training thing to Casey. I don't know if you've come across I know very little about it. I know some people who have done it or done it on certain levels with the idea that, that you end up potty training your kid earlier than you otherwise would by starting when they're babies. And obviously, they're incapable of taking themselves to the bathroom when they're that little. So the parent has to basically observe and take them. Uh, but but that is a thing that people do. I, that was a very poor explanation of it, but it exists and you can read about it if you're so inclined. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Potty training faster means that you're going to have less mm -hmm. diapers on there. Right. I think it also has to do with like a more regimented feeding schedule as mm -hmm. well. So you can be a little bit more predictive with it. Yeah. Um, and I'm reading a book right now about how to sleep train your kid. That's very similar way where you're timing their feedings so that you can help get them to sleep longer faster <laughs> um but let's get down to what you guys came here for because we're a nature sustainability conservation podcast the environmental impact of cloth versus plastic disposable diapers sarah what's your gut instinct on this one i mean my my gut instinct wants to say that reusable is better that's yeah. what i got yeah that is my gut instinct that is what i have been told that is what lots of articles will say the fact that you posed the but. question like that <laughs> yeah, makes, makes me think there's a but. <laughs> but okay so part of it is that i think that the argument is very similar to the plastic bag versus cotton mm -hmm. tote argument which is that when you use a cotton tote there's a lot of resources that are built into right. that cotton tote um, versus the plastic bag which has less resources but it doesn't take away that it sits in a landfill for its entire life because it doesn't breakdown and there is no true recycling method right now used on any sort of large scale for disposable diapers so once you use them and you throw them away they will sit in the landfill for the equivalent of human forever because it'll be longer than several lifespans mm -hmm. 
And I looked for studies. And first of all, I was disappointed that a lot of the studies are from like the 80s and 90s. Because as we talked about, cloth diapering and disposable diapers have both come a long way since then. Like I think of diapers as being these huge padded things from when we were kids, Mm -hmm. but they're not anymore. They're a lot smaller, like the disposables. Um, And same thing where if you're thinking about the cloth diapers of yesteryear with the washing machines of yesteryear, which is a lot of the environmental impact of cloth diapers is making sure that they're laundered. That's different now than it was then too. I only found one study that I felt really good about, and that was actually from the UK. Um, Their environmental agency did, let me find the title of it. Um, So they don't call them diapers in the UK. They call them nappies. And so it's life cycle assessment of disposable and reusable nappies in the UK. And it is 200 pages long. Oh, (laughs) and I read most of it. I did skim. There are lots of tables. So it is long, but it is pretty comprehensive. They go through, okay, there are different types of cloth diapering systems. And they tried to, gosh, uh, they surveyed people on their behaviors of the use. They talked to diaper companies about how these diapers were each made. They looked at the different laundering techniques. They looked at the different impacts. And what they found is that based on their life cycle analysis, and again, one of those weighted environmental impact scores, that there is not a big difference between reusable and disposable diapers. Okay. This study is from 2008. So again, it's like 15 years old. There are some things that have changed since then. They said basically the considerations they were looking at were carbon footprint, water consumption, pesticide use, disposal. The study recommends that disposable companies focus on reducing the weight of the diaper because if you can make them smaller that means that there's less materials in it which as you say we have done over the years even since then i saw another study that looked at the impact of pampers improvements from 2007 to 2010 they reduced like packaging by 72 percent and they reduced the weight of the diaper and they were looking at that and found that yes they had already reduced a bunch of the environmental impact from previous versions and that was in 2010 so i'm sure that we're still doing more and more of that i also need improvement in materials because there is crude oil extraction as part of the disposable diaper process this Mm -hmm. is not a green method by any means like it's even if if the environmental impact is about comparable to cloth it's not like a net positive right (laughs) it's still not great um for reusables they recommend reducing energy and water consumption which is the biggest footprint for them so it's the laundering that's the big issue whether you get it from a service or you do it at home laundering is the biggest footprint part of it but they don't end up in the landfill as frequently yeah we've talked about this with the bags because every once in a while i do have a sort of crisis of conscience when you read those yeah. life cycle assessment things that are like well paper bags are even worse than you know whatever right. and this much goes into a cotton and all of that and i which i th- those are valid yes discussions and things that that we should be talking about but i do always just come back to eat but it we have no end of life plan for these things so that does stick in my brain but still it is encouraging to me overall to hear this i think that that disposables have improved first of all and that you know there's not maybe as huge of a difference as i would have anticipated there being the end of life thing does still make me want to weigh reusables as higher you know but Um, But overall, I feel like I'm actually encouraged by the things that you've said so far. I think maybe I want to see a graph, and I didn't look at this because it just occurred to me now, of like environmental impact of diapers, like a little graph about how the disposables have changed over time. So I think that would be more encouraging to me than like people are putting extra effort into cloth sure. diapering and it might yeah. not have as much. They, yeah. So there's, yeah, there's I agree, of, I agree. yeah. There's a lot of limitations to this study. They had trouble getting a good sample size of people who do use cloth diapers and like what their actual 
habits are compared to that. They also said they had a lot of trouble getting a hold of cloth diapering companies and getting them to fill out their entire questionnaire with good data uh, versus, I mean, the disposable diaper industry is much larger and mm-hmm. probably much more powerful in yeah. some ways. So they provided lots of data. <laughs> um, big diaper, <laughs> big diaper companies. I mean, for real, you do. I, I did find it like is, a lot but... of studies of like, oh, huh, what's? I don't know who's funding this, but yeah, it's it's an interesting conclusion, and it's the only one that I felt like yeah. I was I felt like was comprehensive enough to make some sort of conclusion when it yeah. comes to it i don't i this was not meant to be like ah oh, that the, then the reusable diaper industry is worthless i don't right. that, that's not what i pull from this at all i'm just really glad that they both exist i'm glad that they both seem to be improving like i said i just i think yes. because i i think for me the biggest mark against reusable is convenience and they have gotten so much more convenient and you know i think that the the biggest mark against the uh, disposables is that lack of end of life (laughs) yeah yeah uh which obviously still exists but if we are doing better at paring down the size and the material use that's a step in the right direction for that yeah that's a step in the right direction i've seen advertisements for diapers that are disposable that are like claim to be more sustainable because they come from like plant-based fibers or things like that. Um, I I didn't look at any studies when it comes to that. I actually, when I was looking at the reviews of the ones sold at target, they weren't very good. So I was like, all right, I'm not going to pursue spending a little bit more on those right now because as a first time parent, I'm not about to resign myself to blowout after blowout just because I, I may or may not be helping the environment on that one. They there's no good recycling or composting for current diapers. At least 80% end up in landfills. I found a lot of uh, different numbers about how how much of our waste is diapers. Anywhere from like 1% to 2% in some cities and up to 7% of solid waste. Oof. But this also included actually diapers used for folks who have incontinence. Like mm-hmm. adult diapers are another yeah. part of that industry as well. Um, in areas of the world with less sophisticated garbage systems, disposable diapers actually pose a threat to, to public health. Their disposal can impact waterways, air quality, and can spread diseases if they're not properly disposed of. So it's not necessarily something, even though it's got convenience to it, that is ready to be spread to the rest of the world because you do have to have like basically in the U.S., we are sequestering our waste away. We talked to John Shigarian, who is the CEO of a tech recycling company, and he pointed out that smaller countries don't have the luxury we have of having lots of landfills. They have limited space. And this is something that the U.K. has pointed out is that they don't have uh, unlimited space in their landfills. They incinerate a lot more than we do. And since this study came out, Wales has paved its first road using partially plastics from disposable diapers (laughs) what a development right so basically there's a company that takes the diaper and they wash them a whole bunch and then they grind them up into plastic pellets and then they're working them into the asphalt of this road i think that's great didn't we hear about that during covid with like masks um doing Something like that, plastic bottles, yeah, things like that. I I mean, I support learning more about this type of thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's there's innovative steps Mm -hmm. we can take forward. Since the study came out, energy efficiency standards, the U.S. for washing machines were updated in 2012. And there's actually a new rules package, timely, from the Department of Energy that came out like two weeks ago and should hopefully be like officially proposed in about two weeks from now about increasing washing machine and refrigerators efficiency standards for 2027. Nice. So they said that it's been actually way too long since they've been updated. Um, But Energy Star appliances are something that you can look at. They use 20% less energy and 30% less water than regular models. So if that's something that you're looking at, if you're looking at laundering your diapers like I am, like we have, a, we chose a front facing washer specifically because they use less water than the top loading ones. So what have I come down to? The decision I made is that I'm doing both. <laughs> it's hard for me to again to stomach the 2000 diapers that's like a room full of diapers Mm -hmm. just so much 
Um, but also I'm not going to be the only one caring for this kid. And my mom is going to be babysitting. Other people are going to be babysitting. And it seems like a lot to ask them to go through some of the very specific things that you need to go through to make sure that these cloth diapers last a really long time or laundered appropriately. I'm I'm traveling. Mm -hmm. Disposables have an undeniable edge on traveling. And that's actually how they were first introduced to the market. They were marketed as a vacation item that bring it along so you don't have to do laundry when you're on vacation for your baby's diaper. So I'm planning on doing part-time diapering with cloth. And then overnight, I will do disposables because supposedly they help them sleep longer. We will see. And then when she's or either out or she's being taken care of by someone else, we'll do disposables then. And we'll see if I'm like my aunt and I last a week on on clock and then just say, (laughs) yeah, never again. So that's the beauty of it, though. You can see what works for you. You can make your decisions now and and try to plan and prepare and then if it doesn't work yeah, change it up but i feel like that sounds like a super reasonable compromise to make i am hoping and i i will say that i don't have anyone in my circle who has done cloth diapering that i felt like i could ask those clarifying questions of like is it truly easier so i think doing both is going to help me get a better perspective of it and i hope to give you guys an update later when i'm (laughs) come back from maternity leave of what it's like. But for now, I am waiting for the second half of my cloth diapers to arrive in the mail, <laughs> the interior portions of them, and along with my uh, new laundry detergent that I'm going to be using. So, so yeah, that was all the things I found about babies. Awesome. You can take that information in and continue to make the best plans for what's going to work for you and your family. But I thought that was fascinating like so many little things that I either had never thought about or never heard about Um, so good stuff thanks guys all right we'll be back with your challenge of the week all right guys we are back with our challenge of the week be honest i don't have a really good one this week (laughs) if you got somebody in your life who's having a baby or you're having a baby um start to think of ways that maybe you can help them be a little bit greener in having a kid so again we're not on the shaming train by any means we just want happy healthy babies for people who have been you know are are being thoughtful parents who want to make sure their kids have good lives Um, But as we discussed in this episode, there's a lot of little factors that can go either way. So um, maybe you can have a conversation with one of the things that resonated with you in this or something you learned that you wanted to share with that person. Um, And if they've got a registry, maybe you can find something on there that fits the criteria that we talked about here or offer to help them locate hand-me-downs, use your network to be able to to help bring in more reusable items. But obviously, I know it's not going to apply to everybody here. Uh, But if you have a story about cloth diapering or any sort of other element that has to do with sustainability and babies, something we missed, please let us know because this is a whole chapter of my life I'm about to enter that I'm very excited to hear everybody's thoughts on. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you can reach out to us in in lots of ways if you have any tips or stories or suggestions or questions that you want to get to us and I'll tell you where to do that in a moment but I will also say yeah like this as with everything this challenge is going to apply to some of us it's not going to apply to everyone although Casey those were some great suggestions on how this could you know this can apply to a broader audience beyond just if you're not having a baby yourself that's some ways that you can get involved in this too but also if this doesn't apply to you if you don't know anybody that's expecting or, or has little kids as always you know these challenges are for where you're at in your life. So if this one doesn't work for you, pick a different episode, pick a different challenge that you didn't get to do before. Or whenever you're listening, any of our challenges are are always there for you to take on. So if you do want to reach out to us at all, you can find us everywhere. We're on Facebook, A Little Greener Podcast. We're on Instagram at A Little Greener Pod. We're on Twitter at A Greener Podcast. And you can email us at a little greener podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for joining me, Sarah. If uh, you guys are interested at all, 
the show notes are always a good place to find our mm-hmm. sources. There are so many other things out there for this particular topic. I really want to encourage you to find primary sources, not just opinions that people have on the internet about what feels right for them um, because everyone has different opinions I found out so um, so check those out and uh, and give us a a rating and review if you like the episode Uh, otherwise we will talk to you next week bye